en el que estamos ahora mismo para afrontar ese proceso de reformas del sistema de cooperación que todos percibimos como, como urgente y necesario. Eh, y bueno, compartimos en qué momento estábamos, en los procesos que se habían dado previamente, eh, hasta dónde habíamos avanzado y lo que nos queda por recorrer como coordinadora para fijar eh, aquellos temas y posiciones en, en, los que, en los temas en los que nos parecen más relevantes, ¿no? importantes para aportar a este proceso de reformas. Eh, y en los siguientes webinars nos dedicaremos a profundizar en cada uno de ellos, pero nos parecía muy importante eh, dedicar este webinar en concreto a, a mirar a nuestro alrededor ¿no? y saber qué cosas necesitamos tener en cuenta en ese camino que vamos a, a emprender. Eh, y qué, qué claves son fundamentales que, y que no podemos olvidar para que realmente ese proceso eh, sea lo más exitoso posible. Entonces, bueno, estamos compartiendo el programa. Eh, vais a, vamos a tener esta, en este webinar tres fases diferentes, tres momentos diferentes. Un primer momento para analizar quizá las, los desafíos, ¿no? los nuevos retos que tenemos en este momento en el contexto internacional, especialmente en el mundo en el que el COVID-19 pues, eh, ha llegado y nos viene a trastocar ya el complejo contexto que teníamos antes de esta, de esta crisis, ¿no? Bueno, pues tenemos ahí una, un grupo de ponentes que nos van a ayudar a, a analizar estos desafíos. Luego vamos a tener un segundo momento para abordar las tendencias que estamos viendo en el sistema de cooperación internacional, que también nos parece importante tener en cuenta para este proceso que vamos a tener en España y además en el que contribuimos, ya que contribuimos también desde España. Y por último nos detendremos para analizar... Eh, y aprender de procesos pasados. ¿no? Este proceso que vamos a empezar, que estamos, en el que estamos ahora inmersas no es un proceso que de repente nos hemos inventado, sino que ya hemos tenido procesos parecidos en el pasado y bueno, pues con sus aciertos ¿no? y también con sus errores. Y nos parece importante eh, mirar ahí para ver un poco lo, lo que hicimos bien en el pasado y debemos seguir manteniendo y aquellas cosas que bueno, pues, eh, nos sirven como lecciones aprendidas para incorporar en este proceso proceso actual. Eh, sí me gustaría comentaros, aunque ya está en el programa, eh, vamos a tener en inglés una primera parte de la primera mesa, la será en inglés eh, y las otras dos ya van a ser en español. Por eso voy a traducir brevemente esta parte porque tenemos algún participante eh, que no habla español, así hacemos esta pequeña introducción en inglés y le pasaré la palabra a Carlos para que nos explique algunas cuestiones eh, técnicas y de logística para facilitar esta sesión. ¿vale? Traduzco brevemente, brevemente en inglés. Ok, welcome for those of you that doesn't speak Spanish. It's nice to see you here and thank you for sharing with us this uh, webinar. For us, this is an important session because, uh, as you already know, we are in a process of um, building and rebuilding the development cooperation system, the public system of development cooperation in Spain. And we, this is why we have established certain seminars and webinars to uh, be able to build the coordinadora's uh, position in this process and see how can we um, be able to contribute to this to this reform. Okay, so uh, we have already had one webinar two weeks ago to explain the process and to, to explain the moment we are in this process. And we will have more webinars to go deeply in every of the issues that uh, we will work on during this reform. But uh, in this case, we thought it was important to establish this seminar dedicated to analyze the context, analyze uh, which are the challenges we have. And this is the, the first round table we will have in this session. Then we will move on in a second phase a stage of this session to help us to analyze which are the trends of the international cooperation system and which are the opportunities and the challenges we have in these trends, okay? Also, because these are the trends, are the tendencies where the Spanish uh, system will contribute to. So, um, we will uh, dedicate the second part of uh, this uh, seminar to these things. And then finally, we will focus on the path because we think that sometimes it's important to learn from the past experiences. Uh, we have had experiences in the, Spani in the Spanish uh, context in these issues and we will analyze which were the things that we 
uh, have done in a good way and we should retake them and learn from them and also those that maybe those mistakes that we have uh, seen in the past that will help us to improve our strategies uh, in this process and now so um, before starting i will uh, i will pass the word the floor to carlos uh, because he he will help us to explain some technical issues to facilitate this uh, webinar carlos Sí. Hola, ¿qué tal? Buenos días a todas y a todos y bienvenidos a este webinar otra vez, el segundo que hacemos. Eh, quería contaros que va a ser muy importante que, bueno, pues, que tengáis a mano el chat, porque en el chat vamos a ir compartiendo varias cosas importantes. Eh, lo va a gestionar mi compañera Verónica y en el chat eh, vais a ver el programa. Vamos a poner también un enlace a un documento donde vais a poder poner vuestras reflexiones y preguntas que vamos a ir recuperando en algunos momentos de, durante el webinar. Eh, y al mismo tiempo también eh, Verónica va a compartir la, la biografía para que conozcáis mejor a los ponentes durante las tres sesiones. ¿vale? Entonces, es importante eh, que tengáis los micros cerrados y que autogestionéis bien los micros cada vez que vayáis a intervenir. Bueno, pues que deis al micro y, y, y es fácil y así fácil. veis que hay muchísima gente, entonces podemos, podemos mejorar el, la calidad de las intervenciones y, y no distorsionar a las personas que están hablando. Y por último deciros que estamos grabando la sesión, eh, lo estamos haciendo por, bueno, pues por, por, por un interés de coordinadora pedagógico, por nuestro trabajo interno con nuestras, nuestras redes, nuestras organizaciones. Y bueno, pues entendemos que nadie de las personas que estéis participando eh, tenéis algún problema con, con esta grabación. Si tuvierais algún problema, pues eh, bueno, pues entráis en contacto ahora mismo con nosotros o bueno, pues eh, tendríamos que ver alguna, alguna solución. Lo que se suele hacer en estos casos es que las personas que no quieren ser grabadas, pues tienen que salir de, 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 del webinar, ¿no? Esperemos que no, sea, que no sea el caso. Y bueno, pues eh, simplemente ya decir que lo que, lo que estaba planteando Marta, vamos a tener tres sesiones. En cada sesión va a haber intervenciones, las personas que van a, que van a hacer su, sus propias reflexiones y luego vamos a tener en cada sesión una parte final de participación. Y es muy importante, como somos muchas personas, que sepáis cómo vamos a gestionar la participación. La participación va a ser en el chat. Quien quiera participar pone un número, pone su nombre y pone su organización. Y a partir de ahí, Verónica va a ir dando los turnos de palabra o la, la moderación va a ir dando los turnos de palabra. ¿vale? Uh, just a quick, uh, uh, quick elements uh, in order to, to uh, manage uh, the technical issues for the people from abroad. abroad. Uh, firstly, welcome to, to the webinar. Uh, the Carlos, perdona, no se te escucha, tienes que... Ah, se me, alguien me ha cerrado. Sí, yeah. Ya está, se me ha oído toda parte en español, ¿no? Luego se me ha cerrado el micrófono, vale, perdón. Sí. Bueno. Uh, just to translate quickly in English, uh, welcome everybody, people that don't speak uh, Spanish, and thank you very much to, to join us. Uh, there are people from other parts of uh, Latin America, from Europe, And we are very, very happy uh, to, to have you together today in this morning. And just uh, quick issues in order to manage. We are a lot of people in the webinar, so it's important to, to manage your, your micros uh, in order to mute off and mute on if you are going to intervene. And there is a, a, a drive, a word drive that we are putting in order to share uh, Uh, your insights, uh, minds, or your questions that we are going to recover uh, during the, the, the webinar. Uh, another thing, an important issue is that uh, uh, the third part that we are going to split uh, the, the whole morning, uh, we are going to dedicate uh, the, the last part of, um, uh, to, to the participation, to, to, to have uh, some questions for, for the, the, the opponents. And uh, the, the way that we are going to manage the participation is in the chat. So uh, each one that uh, want you to address uh, any question, you need to put your number, uh, the number, the name, and the organization. And so it's uh, the, the way that we are going to, to organize the, 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 the questions of the participation for, for, for the speakers. And so we are, we are going to record the webinar. That's an important issue. And uh, I think that uh, 
you, uh, that says something that you, you allow us to, to use uh, this material uh, for uh, awareness rising purposes. And so, yeah, it's important that you, you know that. And so I, I'm going to give the floor to Marta to start the, the, the first session. So Marta, go on. Okay, thank you. Gracias, Carlos. Vamos, como os decía, vamos a dedicar y hacer esta primera sesión solamente en inglés, ¿vale? Luego veremos las intervenciones como las como las gestionamos si alguien quiere hacerlo y no, no puede hacerlo en inglés. Okay, so we will start this first round table. And um, as I mentioned before, the, the idea here is, uh, okay, we have a goal, we, we have a goal, we all want uh, to have a more just, equal and sustainable world. And for this, we think it's so important to really build uh, an, a strong system of development cooperation among other tools that we have to accomplish our goal, okay? But we think that's important that once we have a goal and we know the destiny where we want to, to reach, um, it's important to, to really know which is the, the context that we have uh, and which, what, what things we have around us that may help us to reach our goal and which things uh, maybe will be a problem or will, um, will um, be for us and will put in, in our way some challenges that we will have to to, to go for them, okay? So um, the, the idea in this first uh, round table is to analyze all these contexts, analyze these stones that maybe we will find in our way, and also analyze all these things that can help us to reach uh, our goal. And in, in this way, we will be able to, to uh, design a, a good roadmap that um, will make efficient our way and will really help us in our in our gate in our way to the goal. Okay, so to help us with this, we have um, today three speakers, uh, and we will start with the presentation of Yaya Petrikovsky. Okay, she is the president of the International Forum of National NGOs Platforms. It's called Forus. And uh, she is not with us in this uh, webinar due to the time um, difference because she lives in Brazil. But she has sent us a video that we will share with you now for this uh, first presentation. Okay, so uh, Cristina will help us to, to share the video. Thank you, Cristina. Okay, yeah, yeah. <coughs> I'd like to thank the coordinadora for inviting me to take part in this important debate. The topic proposed for this webinar is really extremely important. The cooperation, especially the one addressed to civil society organizations, has been redirected for some time. Since its birth until current pandemic times, there is a large and a varied path, but it has a very important feature to bolster liberal contemporary democracies worldwide into the commitment towards the human rights agenda. As an activist fighting for indigenous environment and human rights from South America, I understand that cooperation, the official secular and religious cooperation, was vital in our case. It was central in order to break away from military dictatorship that characterized this region from the 60s until late 80s of the last century. The international cooperation has helped to strengthen the political actors of the organized civil society, the social movements, which are the real agents of the democratization of power. A dynamic and strong civil society, together with other democratic political forces, is responsible for a series of a very relevant political agreements. I will mention a few. The construction of a new national constitution that incorporated the landmark of individual and collective rights. The development of a social policies that effectively decrease the poverty and to a lesser scale impacted inequalities. Bigger allocation of wealth with income transfer programs. 
It also helped to face the social environmental issue with a harsher legislation which drastically decreased the destruction of the different biomes. The different social movements as the women's, urban, black, indigenous, LGBT, were able to widen the scope of freedom and equality, defend its territories and build legal landmark towards the defense of the social environment, the, the social environmental sustainability. sustainability. Although still with plenty of contradiction, it was almost 30 years of a democratic experience never before lived in this region. It is important to highlight that I refer to the most unequal region of the world, where historically the elite never committed to the ideals of democracy and citizenship. Those joined or strengthened a wide and predatory development of capitalism. I haven't seen this country, even in the most virtual uh, time of our history, being able to substantially reduce inequalities. A country that is among those who murder human rights and women activists primarily, and with a government openly declaring the annihilation of the indigenous and black population, and the destruction of our forests. As an irony of fate, it was democratically elected. We have been living in one of the cruelest version of the dystopian reality. If there is a political force within the Brazil, Brazilian society that bravely fought against inequalities and multiple discrimination, it was the social movements and the civil society organizations of this active citizenship field. It is also the force that fights for visibility and representativeness in the decision-making process in spaces. This force born from the necessity to exist and fight against the violent discrimination of the powerful elites. It is also the force that is empowered by solidar partnership of the cooperation. As the Latin American feminists say, ni una a menos, our fight has no way back. We are living in difficult and uncertain times. There is a dramatic tension between those who seek the democratization of power on one side and those who wish for more authoritarianism, control, surveillance on the other hand. There is the power of corporation, corporations co-opting governments, rich countries that make use of xenophobia, who close borders and use verbal violence and military force as a response. The extreme right exhales the fascism. The multilateralism unveiled after World War II in a profound crisis. The COVID-19 has heated the tensions. It's an open wound. It is a symptom of many crises that have been put together since the time humanity gave up on quickly implementing the global agreements and consensus regarding human rights to the Paris Agreement, the 23rd Agenda, and the financing for development. The COVID-19 is a warning of an environmental crisis, a climatic hecatomb, a predatory development model, food and nutrition insecurity, and historically unprecedented political and economic uncertainties. COVID-19 is a symptom of the broken system uh, uh, that has flourished in the last decades. System that are based on greed and profit and not on the best interests of the people. Coming back to Brazil, I see once more that concrete solutions that are making a difference in people's life come from, come from the organized civil society and the social movements. These, which are criminalized by the power on one side and abandoned by the national and international cooperation on the other side. 
but they are the one they are the one who remained in their missions and their alliances it is a sector that has legitimacy knowledge and trust of the people as opposed to the governments and decision makers uh, in the power in power in the context of the pandemic they are the people who are risking their lives to save others compensating the absent state they are the ones that articulate with political parties progressive local governments the approval in the national congress of an emergency basic income meant for the unemployed and the vulnerable these movements who organize themselves in order to provide information food and protection equipment to the population that needs them the most and once again the cooperation plays a vital and solidar role to save lives this vein of transmission via the organized civil society have shown themselves ever more effective and positive uh, outcomes what are the future scenarios? Uh, it's very difficult to say. We are sailing through such uncertain times, but I believe once more that are the eco-feminists, uh, the eco-feminists are giving the key for this upcoming future. Our fight is not just an identity struggle. It is also a class struggle that plays the care of life at the core of the economic and political decisions. It is a struggle that confronts the center, center of the patriarchy and the violence of the system. We need to articulate the idea of unrestricted and universal health and care. The civilization crisis invite us to put into motion our cognitive freedom in order to reinvent our connections, affections, ways of living, and so on. The international cooperation needs to be reinvented so that we work all together to be able to propose a new paradigm that puts the needs of people as its guiding light. And this has to be strong enough to begin a new era these are the challenges change the existing system and bring about other possible worlds for the life in our planet and nobody said it would be easy thank you okay so Thank you, Yara, for sharing this with us. <clears throat> I think it's inspiring, some of the things she has, um, she has mentioned. Um, I didn't mention that uh, you have on the chat all the background of the speakers, okay? So I will not dedicate time uh, to, to resume the, the background of every of the, of the speakers. So you have it in the chat and we will have time in this way to, to really listen to them, which I think it's, it's the most important thing. And we will also have uh, time at the end of the, the three presentations to, to talk with them and to think all together, okay, and have a small debate. So um, we will move from this global vision from Foros to an European vision. And to this we have with us um, Jan Saldana, okay, from Eurodat, the European Network on the Depth uh, and Development. Okay, so um, Jan, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, am I unmuted now? Yeah. Excellent. We can hear you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, can you see me too? Yeah, probably. Excellent. Yes, so, 
<laughs> uh, good morning, uh, and thank you very much uh, for this invitation. Um, I'm really pleased to be part of your reflections first thing this morning. Um, as as you, many of you know me, I've been around in civil society for many years, uh, previously with CITSE, uh, and we worked very closely with, uh, with the Spanish platform as part of the Financing for Development Working Group in CITSE, and particularly with Marta, uh, Marta, who is also on this webinar from Manos Unidas and uh, Marco, obviously. So it's nice to be among uh, all friends. Uh, it's a very important reflection, obviously, that you are going through, and I wish you all the very best with it. Obviously, uh, you are undertaking this reflection in very special times. These are uncertain times, obviously, for all of us. We are all stuck at home. Uh, we do not know uh, what is going to happen to development in uh in the next six months, in the next year. We don't know what is going to happen to our families, to our children, what is happening to this generation. We don't know what is going to happen to the economy. We don't know if you're going into a global recession or it's going to be deeper than that. Are we going into the worst depression that we've seen since the 1920s from the previous century? All of these are very, very uncertain. And naturally, very, very naturally, there is a yearning to go back to normal. Uh, everybody wants these measures to be eased. We want to go back to doing things normally as we knew them. But for many social movements and for many people who are addressing this current crisis, the issue that is being raised is, was the normal really a desirable normal? And the response is, actually, the normal was abnormal. The normal that we were in was an anomaly. And that is something that we first of all need to address. First of all, obviously, we as uh, uh, organizations working on the front line of development know more than anyone uh, uh, else that the way that the development paradigm has been unfolding, particularly in the last 10 years, particularly uh, since the financial crisis of 2008, was a paradigm of austerity, was a paradigm where you saw the deepening of the Washington consensus, the Washington consensus of deregulation, liberalization, privatization of public services. And then in 2015, as a result of the Addis Ababa action agenda, the whole discussion around uh, the role of uh, the private sector, you had the emergence of what we are calling now the Wall Street consensus, which basically is about the so-called World Bank maximizing financing for development agenda. Essentially, what it has done it is it has put the role of the private sector and private actors in the front of development and as a result of that, you have risky public-private partnerships that have sought to transform public services, including healthcare, including education and water, and made them into asset classes, which are essentially financed by the private uh, sector and private investors. On the other side of this, you've also had ODA and the profile that of ODA that has also changed, obviously. You're seeing on the one hand, uh, donors who have not been fulfilling their ODA 0.7 commitments and on the other hand whatever scarce ODA that there is being channeled into leveraging private finance through development finance institutions and where is that money essentially going to? Is it going to poverty? It is essentially going into infrastructure uh, investment, it is going into service sector investment, it is going into productive se sector investment. We found in Eurodad that the amount that is going to poverty is just a tiny percentage as compared as the amount that is being leveraged to be invested in many other sectors in which poor people are hardly the direct beneficiaries. So on the one hand, you see a, a great change in the development finance par paradigm. On the other hand, you have seen uh, growing uh, levels of debt of countries who essentially, because of the falls in uh, ODA, 
have had no choice but to turn to the private financial sector to borrow money to invest for their own development. So what you have seen is essentially debt that has grown to become uh, much more than in the past. Um, in 2018, for which we have the last figures for, we've seen a jump of, of uh, debt growing from um, almost um, half of um, or double the amount of money that uh, poor countries were spending on repaying their debts uh, in 2018 as compared to 2010. So you're seeing almost a doubling of the amount of money from uh, budgets that are already quite uh, limited being spent on paying off debts. And this was in 2018. You so saw you're seeing much costlier debt. You're seeing it to be also much more risky. So what does that mean? Essentially, what that has meant today in this crisis is that countries are much more exposed to, to, to the private uh, 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 finance uh, market, which means that investors, as soon as they see that governments are exposed to these risky uh, debts, are going to immediately withdraw their money as soon as they smell a crisis happening. And that's exactly what happened in the last two months. Essentially, what we have seen is almost 91 and a half billion of private investment or capital outflows from developing countries in just a month. So that is all the money that has essentially evaporated from these countries in just a month when these countries needed the money most. Along with this, you have the tax justice agenda. Obviously, tax is something that directly can flow into public budgets, and that money can be the money used, for instance, uh, for countries to, to cushion their, uh, uh, their economy, uh, their, their small producers, uh, their workers, and their public sector in times like this. That's what we are seeing in Europe. But in developing countries, in poor countries, this is not the case. They do not have that money. Because essentially what has happened is we've seen that the tax justice agenda is problematic. The rules that have been put in place for cooperation do not include the countries that need it the most. The global tax governance agenda is totally unsatisfactory. The tax system is a broken system. As a result of all this, we have seen that the vulnerable migrant workers, displaced people, particularly women, are the ones who are suffering the most at this time. And unfortunately, the situation is going to get worse. Just last, last week or two weeks ago, the UN Secretary General said that the victims of this crisis are the women and the girls who are being physically, mentally, psychologically uh, 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 victimized the most in this crisis. It's almost a war of domestic violence that we are seeing at this time. So how do we address this situation? I think we can uh, divide our, our response into two distinct uh, 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 timelines. Obviously, you have the, the most immediate actions that we need to take. We have a short window, right? We have a small window of action that we need to address. Obviously, it is important to look into the medium term, which is the second uh, phase, but the short term action is absolutely essential. In the short term, what are we talking about? We need debt relief. And we, we saw announcements last week where we had uh, the, the IMF and the G20 announcing essentially that they were going to um, uh, suspend uh, the payment of, uh, of uh, debt servicing of a certain number of countries. Well, that was good, but that was not enough. Essentially what it has done is kick the ball down the road which will mean that in 2021, these countries will have to res resume their payment of debts in a time when the 
economy of the world is going to be totally in a slump. Can you imagine that? Essentially, what we are asking for is the immediate cancellation, not only of debt servicing, but of debt itself for all countries who are spending right now much more than they should be on servicing their creditors, on servicing their debts, than actually investing in their public health systems. We're talking about also essentially not spending ODA, because that's what's currently happening, that's the current discussion, not spending ODA on, on compensating for the moratorium on debt payments, Rather, ODA should be going to sectors that need it the most, particularly the health sector. What we've seen in the last few years is that uh, the amount of ODA that has gone to the health sector has been reduced by a third. Not surprisingly, the world is, is, is so nervous about how the, the global health system is going to be able to deal with this crisis. Thirdly, there are urgent and immediate actions that need to be done to repair the tax health, uh, the tax uh, system. I mean, there are already discussions that started many years ago, ago about better rules for uh, transferring information, which would help developing countries to clamp down on illicit financial flows. Even though the OECD has claimed that it has done a lot, that has been far from sufficient, not only for the for, for, for OECD countries, even less for the countries uh, who are not part of the OECD negotiation tables. And then on ODA, you might have seen that the UN has called for a new Marshall Plan, a Marshall Plan which essentially would not be more than a, a quarter of the undelivered ODA commitments. And that would basically be money that should go to the urgently needed sectors that have been totally neglected so far. These are short-term measures that essentially need to be taken. But in the medium term, we have to realize that we need to change the whole paradigm, as Yara was speaking about just now. It is, it is not long-term, it is medium-term. Because what we have realized, learning the lessons from our strategies with regard to the 2008 financial crisis, was that either you, you, you act in the medium term as countries start to reflect what would be the lessons learned from the crisis, or you will end up with the state of the world going back into a state of business as usual that we essentially saw very soon after, that followed very soon after the financial crisis in 2008. And in the medium term, it will mean a serious reflection on global governance with regard to debt issues, with regard to tax issues, ending austerity, ending the public, uh, 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 the private sector first uh, paradigm that has begun to rule the whole uh, development uh, uh, um, uh, um, development finance paradigm uh, that we have seen of late. I think I've uh, taken more than what I was supposed to take as my time. I just want to end by quoting uh, uh, my favorite author, Arundhati Roy, who's written a brilliant essay called This Pandemic as a Portal. And she says, historically, pandemics have forced human beings to break with the past and imagine this wo their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. Friends, this crisis is a crisis of unimaginable proportions and we need a response. We need a response that very few have dared to dream to be possible, but we have to dream and make that unimaginable a reality for our community, but particularly for those who have been pushed even further behind by this crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jen. Thank you for helping us in this uh, unimaginable situation to analyze the consequences of the current system in the, in the most vulnerable and also to, to help us to give some lights 
to that can help us to see where we should focus in the short and medium term. Let's see if we can really um, use this door and imagine uh, a new and different world behind that door. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, we had another uh, speaker uh, planned in, in this session from Concord, and she was Tanya Cox, but uh, sadly, um, well, I have to inform you that her father died these days ago, and uh, she's, she cannot be here with us today, so we send them our deep condolences in these moments. And uh, we were looking for another person from Concord to, to share with us this session, but uh, also, due to healthy problems, it's, it was not possible. So, well, this is just to inform you because some of you may know her. So, this is the situation. And this is why we will jump into the next speaker. Um, he is Stefano Preto, Prato, sorry, and he is the Managing Director of the Society of International Development, SID. Um, I will, uh, Stefano, I will leave you the floor. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. So, lo, bueno, eh, soy Stefano de la Society for International Development. Lo siento mucho, pero creo que voy a hablar, hablar en inglés, ¿no? Pues, ya que es un poco más fácil para mí. Pero es realmente horrible para un italiano hablar en, con sus hermanos españoles en inglés, ¿no? Así, por favor, acepte de, mis disculpas pero no me gustaría que se perdieran la risa para mi español, ¿no? So, um, anyway, so I had, uh, I, it's a great to, to be in touch and to be discussing these things together. Um, I have prepared uh, a bit, uh, a small presentation looking at the economic and financial uh, implications of the crisis and a little bit of the short-term and longer-term measures ahead. But I think I've just decided to, to shift because uh, my good friend Jean in many ways covered uh, many of those elements. So rather than replicating that, uh, um, let me just go a little bit uh, by heart uh, in a different direction. Um, first of all, I think it's important to recognize the implications of the crisis into our uh, political economies, and particular in our system of multilateralism. Um, I think I, I've read something very interesting written by Danny Roddick on, you know, asking the questions: Will COVID uh, remake the world? And I see a lot of our colleagues uh, in civil society in different uh, organizations, networks, uh, somehow struggling, of course, with the crisis, with its uh, very deep uh, social and economic consequences, but at the same time calling for this as the moment for transformation, you know, because the crisis exposes in many ways things that we have been advocating for for many years, uh, and therefore they see into this uh, a moment in which we can change direction. Um, and this puts us in a, in, a, in a state of mind, which is the one of, here we go, this is the moment to change uh, the policy direction and somehow reshape the world. I, I'm very sorry to, to say that I disagree with that. Uh, not that I disagree that the crisis exposes many of our analysis, but unfortunately, um, the reality of crisis is that as all dynamics have winners and losers, and in all crises, the winners are always the strongest. And what we are beginning to see emerging are already responses that actually ossify and strengthen the dynamics that actually took us here in the first place. And uh, so for me, and it's interesting, uh, Roderick quotes this as a confirmation bias. The confirmation bias is the fact that we all want to see into the crisis uh, our own world vision, you know? And therefore, we tend to see into it uh, 
what we already have within ourselves. So we have a sort of a confirmation bias in thinking that this is yet the moment in which our world vision happens and comes true. But the problem is that we are not uh, the strongest. So that same confirmation bias applies uh, to many others. And in fact, what have we seen is uh, a, a very strong undermining of multilateralism. Uh, we've seen a fast advancing of digitalization, even beyond the very many caveats uh, that we as civil society has exposed. Uh, and I can continue, you know? So, uh, unfortunately, I have the feeling that we need to confront the crisis uh, as the peak of our resistance uh, much more than as the opportunities for profound change. Don't get me wrong. I, I don't think, of course, I, I have a hope that we use the crisis to understand that our system is rotten and we need to emerge with a new reality. But unfortunately, this is not going to be the dominant force at play. The dominant force at play is going to be the opposite, the, the strength of the strongest that will impose yet again the same set of solutions uh, that have actually led us to the crisis in the first place. So my first notion here is to be very careful to enter into a sort of a change gear we are first and foremost into a resistance gear. Let me take a deep dive, for instance, into what is happening with food. You know, we are into a food crisis. Uh, the crisis made us and exposed clearly that so many families are one day away from, uh, from hunger, uh, one school meal away from hunger and malnutrition and many other things. But what are we seeing as a response? The criminalization of informal markets uh, in very many cases, including my own country, all uh, informal markets are closed where local producers sell their produce, fish markets are closed. Uh, there is a general sense that the safe product is uh, the industrial product. There is a big push for digitalization which is the opposite of what we need in terms of forging a stronger reconnection between producers and consumers. And I can go on. And that's not the point, because I'm using this as an exemplification. So even within food, what is happening is actually completely contrary to what should happen. And there is a complete rejection of using, for instance, the Committee on World Food Security, which is the multilateral space, that we've agreed be the core of our response to crisis because it was reformed at a time of crisis as the space in which we devise, we address the challenges and we devise uh, solutions. So I'm afraid that we need to first and foremost recognize that this is the moment of highest possible resistance rather than a moment in which uh, we will simply see our reality happen. Now, uh, as I say this, and I don't want to be looked at, oh, yet again, another pessimist uh, uh, sort of into the equation. No, I I'm just uh, looking, and because I have the, uh, the maybe luxury of working across so many spaces, because, uh, you know, but let's see what is happening in health with the attack on the WHO, uh, let's see what is happening in food. Jean uh, explained fairly well what is happening within within economic and finance. You know, so it is happening in so many different spaces. So we need to recognize that we need to be on the guard for actually a further push of what didn't work, rather than the contrary. Of course, we cannot stop there, right? We cannot only uh, be stuck into a resistance war, but we need to be aware that that is the case. Um, my second notion is that we need to have uh, a, a bit of a more sophisticated analysis of, of the crisis. Um, of course, we know it's a real life crisis, human, social, uh, real economy, and in that respect, it's very different uh, than the past financial crisis. You know, and it's, I don't think that parallel uh, 
uh, should even be used in many ways. Mm, but what the, the most important element of the crisis is that I think it shows the depth of our structural multidimensional inequalities within and between countries. Certainly, the magnification of gender inequalities is, is clear in so many domains from the centrality of the unpaid uh, and the unresolved issue of unpaid care work, uh, but also the reality that uh, the stay home message uh, has led to yet another increase in gender based violence uh, uh, and many other dimensions. But also the fact that it's clear increasingly that inequalities within countries is trapped by inequalities between countries. And there's no way to resolve one without resolving the other. Yes. Now, here we need to recognize that we are in many ways part of the problem. Why do I say that? Because our inequality analysis has been far little sophisticated. It has been much more of a banner, of a choreography, but we need to go one step further and recognize that the, the need for, for econ an economic transformation that really addresses clearly the reality of commodity traps, the shifts the center of gravity of economic activities into the local, into the domestic, and, and, and therefore contrast in a sense, uh, the existence of unbearable restrictions uh, on policy and fiscal space within developing countries, but not only, you know? So I think that's uh, something that we need to build much more thoroughly into, into our analysis, including, of course, the fact that, uh, you know, many say, well, you know, but uh, uh, the state is back. Yes, the state is back, and, and certainly, um, we all realize the centrality of the state uh, on many critical social issues from health to food to social protection. But I don't expect uh, that the dominant doctrines uh, that Jean explained fairly well are going to be gone simply because of the crisis. So once again, we need a much more sophisticated analysis. And that takes me to the last um, uh, sort of point which is the issue of the crisis of multilateralism. Because once we understand the crisis, we recognize that first and foremost, we need to be on the guard for resistance. Secondly, we need to have an uh, in-depth understanding of the crisis uh, to, to recognize the extent of the social economic transformation that we need. But where do we locate that struggle? And certainly that a struggle that requires uh, uh, a vibrant uh, multilateralism. Now, the problem of multilateralism is that uh, it's, it's a bit of a, um, it's a very complicated issue to address, you know? Sometimes you're not sure whether you need a, a reform or an exorcism. Um, Sorry, Stefano. Sorry, Stefano, your your microphone is uh, is turned off. Stefano, can you hear me? Your microphone? No, I think it's uh, just on the screen. The microphone is off. Se lo silenciaron. Ah, okay, okay. Oh, Sorry. Okay. I must I must have clicked on it. <laughs> anyway, let me let me conclude rapidly. So. The issue of the crisis of, of multilateralism, we need to be very careful on how we address it. First of all, we need, once again, a proper analysis. A lot of people, even within civil society, I think mention a crisis of legitimacy. I think that's very dangerous to express. Um, I think we need to separate le the legitimate issues, the legitimacy issue, from the actual dynamics that undermine the capacity of our multilateral system to perform its duties. But today, for me, the universal, a multilateral UN system remains the one that has the greatest, uh, if not the only, legitimacy uh, as a space. So let's separate legitimacy from the dynamics at place. And the dynamics, unfortunately, are trapped by 
political economies. Yes, of course, we have multiple deficits uh, of vision, of knowledge, uh, democratic deficits, bureaucratic deficits. We have certain degrees of geopolitical misalignment with uh, negotiating blocks that do not reflect today's reality. But these are, to some extent, issues that we should put in the second order. The, the UN system remains uh, the most legitimate system where we can gather to address, uh, you know, a reform, rethinking, redesign agenda. The problem is that we need to recognize that our governments, and particularly when, when I say ours, I say Europeans in particular, has been acting with a systematic uh, a mix of underfunding, undercapacity, and generation of political impasses in any important process. Uh, and they've used this, uh, uh, a process that they themselves have generated uh, by expose the incapacity of the UN to deliver, and therefore they created shadow institutions, uh, very often of dubious uh, legitimacy, under the pressure on the urgent need to deliver. And this has been also supported by very complacent UN staff. I'm sorry, UN staff used to be on our side during the conference on the 90s, but it's no longer the case that actually facilitate the shifting of mandates. I mean, it's very interesting how, uh, if you look at tax, for instance, Jean has alluded to that. It's a very perfect example in which there is a constant pressure to create a space within the United Nations to address uh, uh, the current uh, nonsense uh, tax arrangements uh, and really resolve uh, um, the the continuous bleeding of resources from the south with an intergovernmental uh, tax convention and tax body and how this is constantly opposed by the OECD claiming that the OECD has the solution uh, for everyone else you know and our governments european governments are at the core of that exercise now, we also, in that analysis of multilateralism, we need to also recognize if we, as NGOs, uh, as civil society, are part of the problem. Because I believe we do. We are part of the problem. We're part of the problem because we have been the first one to jump uh, into all sorts of multi-stakeholder solutions uh, that have actually generated shadow organizations to many UN spaces, uh, simply because of our own political economies, our own desire, you know, to be somehow in the lead. And we've confused uh, very much uh, our roles uh, and, uh, and have, in some respects, undermined the, uh, the role of mu legitimate multilateral space. So how do we respond to this? I mean, it's, it's a bit difficult because it's, it's between being between a rock and a hard place, right? Because on one hand, we need to defend the system that we also criticize. This is exactly what has happened with WHO, no? Uh, with the US attack on the legitimacy of WHO, many of us found ourselves in a, in a complex position. So we need to defend the WHO, but we also disagree with the WHO, particularly the way in which it has been managed over the past year. So it's not, it's not easy to find that particular location. But, it's important for me to, one, to reaffirm the centrality of universal multilateral organizations under the UN umbrella and their legitimacy. Uh, two, uh, move beyond uh, simple choreographic, choreographic references to human rights, uh, which we all put in our speeches, but we don't derive consequential implications in governance in terms of rejecting multi-stakeholderism exposing the problematic participation of private sector participation and the conflict of interest that comes with it and reject the notion that we can actually be a civil society and private sector be considered uh, as equal bearer of interests and uh, have a much stronger and deeper um, analysis of inequalities and putting the tackling of multidimensional inequality as the guiding star of the multilateral systems. And lastly, really challenge whether we still need or not a UN development system, 
of course, I'm not referring to humanitarian assistance. Uh, so let let me be clear that that's a different uh, mechanism. But do we still need a UN development system, and do we need still that sort of project formula from north to south? That many of us are also ingrained with. So I think it's we need to reflect. Uh, on how to respond to the crisis of multilateralism in a proper way. To conclude, many challenges for us in this crisis. I think it's not only, uh, it's a crisis to reflect on, on our own role, you know, and recognize that we have been, in many respects, part of the problem. Stepping out and become part of the solution means also recognizing that we live in a world with uh, such a concentration of economic and political power that policy advocacy is trapped necessarily. Because very often we do advocate for solutions or for changes with those uh, that actually are the primary beneficiaries of the status quo. That means that logic, technical based solutions, you know, it's largely unhelpful. We need to go back of generating a much stronger social base. Uh, we need to uh, abandon this idea on who writes first the press release on the, on the latest news and the best report on this and that, and really engage into scaling up uh, demand for change, working in uh, what I call functional unity. Um, biology has a, a fantastic way of resolving complexity. Um, it did not resolve complexity by scaling up uh, the size of a single cell. It tried. If you look at bacteria, it actually tried. But as soon as the, each single cell becomes bigger, uh, it becomes dysfunctional. And this applies to us as well. The more our size becomes big, very often we become trapped in our internal bureaucracy and we become dysfunctional. Our strength is to work as our liver, small, single cells that operate in functional unity with a very strong, clear sense of purpose. I think that's the way forward. Thank you so much. OK, thank you very much, Stefano. Thank you for helping us also to put the focus on the international, multidimensional, multilateral um, level uh, for this invitation also to make uh, the deeper and sophisticated analysis to really understand what is going on and what we should work on. And also I think it's very interesting this invitation just not to look uh, outside of ourselves in these proposals and in this change we need but also to look inside ourselves and this invitation to really um, change our way of, of behaving and way of working as civil society also and as organizations. So thank you very much. Um, we have about 10 minutes, more or less, of a debate. So uh, I will leave the floor open to see if you have any questions or comments. I will recommend you, if you can, to make and share your comments and questions in English, but if you want and you don't feel comfortable with it, just uh, you can make it in Spanish and I will translate it as you wish, okay? So the floor is open. Remember in the chat, you can just uh, ask for the floor in the chat if you want. Anyone? Hello, good morning. Marco. Yes, uh, thank you. Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Marco from Manos Unidas. Thanks a lot for your inspiring words. Uh, Jean. No. Can you hear Marco? Sorry? 
Can you hear me? The problem in the audio, please can you repeat it again, Marco? Because we had some cut in your in your intervention. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yeah, let's try. Let's see. Try to switch off okay, the camera, go, go. Marco. La camera, quítate la camera. Yeah, maybe we we'll... Okay. Okay. Okay, can you hear me better? Yeah. Yes. Yes, thank you. Okay, I will try just just once for not losing time. Uh, for Stefano, you say at the end of uh, your words that uh, putting inequality uh, with all its dimensions uh, should be as the, the guiding mm -hmm. point for the multiralism. Uh, I think that this is quite clear for all of us, but what does it mean really? I mean, uh, in terms of uh, policies, economical decisions and a lot of things, in the multilateralism, uh, I suppose that it entails a lot of things. So I would like to ask you if you could develop a little more uh, these questions. I think that it's quite important. I mean, the qualities at the center of the policies. But what does it mean uh, after uh, COVID-19? That's a question. Thanks. Thank you, Marco. I don't know if you want to answer now. There is no one else that has us for the floor. Thanks. Um, so I think when, um, f first of all, when we're talking about in multi, uh, inequalities, I always refer to multidimensional inequalities. And where multidimensional, I mean not only economic, I think we have been overly focused on the income gaps, huh? okay? But it's economic, social, it's intergenerational because this also brings in the, the climate question, uh, I think, into the equation. And uh, of course, it, it is across uh, so many different uh, fractures, which are geographic, which are uh, vertical, horizontal, and, and intergenerational again. So I think it's important to speak about multidimensional inequalities. Now, the problem when you look at multidimensional inequalities, you recognize that there is uh, the same social groups eh, and the same geography are always at the bottom of the distribution of any analysis we make. So it really exposes structures of, uh, uh, of governance uh, and in many ways structures of our fundamental systems. Now, in all of this, I don't want to be economic-centered, okay, and neglect uh, uh, other dimensions. So I hope you're not going to get me wrong. But the greatest transformation is an economic transformation. It means to recognize that we will never get out of the inequality trap if we do not rebalance the current division of labor within, between countries. The one that has assigned basically to the South the production of primary commodities and has, has blocked so many countries into commodity traps in which their own uh, reality is one of producing for exports. And what we've seen into, for instance, the African context is actually a deindustrialization over the past years and premature tertiarization, where the primary uh, booming is the, the service sector, but not service in the way we understand it. It's largely logistics for exports, okay? So that means that we need to shift the center of gravity away from the global into the domestic because that's the only way to create a vicious, a virtuous cycle between wages and global demand without increasing the local demand by increasing wages. Eh? And the fact that therefore we make a closer connection with the fact that we produce locally and we buy locally. Um, of course, wages will always be compressed, you know, because what's the, 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 the possibility of raising wages if only producing for exports? It only undermines your competitiveness. But in a local economy, it doesn't work that way. The more you grow wages, the more people are going to buy the same products you produce. So the, the centrality of the domestic economy is the critical uh, step forward. But this requires changes in trade, investment, and finance uh, systems, because at the moment, this is not possible. You know? And we. The, the main, we always put a lot of effort, uh, emphasis on, on exports, but the reality, the problem are imports. 
Now, there is going to be an immediate response because many currencies are going to be going through devaluation, which is going to make imports much more expensive. And this automatically is shifting towards local production. This is critical. There is, or, and, and we need to strengthen that as much as possible. In so many different countries, they are realizing that either because of the, the crisis of value chains, the block of value chains, or simply the devaluations uh, and the increase of uh, cost of imports, uh, that they are giving a new impetus to domestic production. Not only Lebanon, but also Italy, you know? We started producing internally many things we use not to produce internally. This is something that there's a whole uh, community that is trying to contrast it. By further advance uh, WTO decisions, even uh, during this phase of lockdown and many other dynamics. Why? Because they see into that uh, the possible seeds of that transformation of trade investment and financial system, which we actually need. So in that, the crisis is an opportunity and that's the fundamental element putting commodity traps, uh, tackling commodity traps on the top of the agenda and using the narrative that comes from the crisis to do it. For me, this is the most important dimensions in tackling inequalities. Because the moment we do this, then domestic economies begin to move. Uh, we begin to shift away from economies of rent to economies of wages. Uh, and therefore, the entire system gets in motion once again. And it's much easier then uh, to address other types of inequalities in that context in which fiscal revenues increase and so forth. So, of course, there's no silver bullet, but this is critical in moving forward. I can mention many other things, but I think this is, this is fundamental. Thanks. Thank you. Jean, I don't know if you want to comment anything. Marco? Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I mean, I fully uh, concur with what Stefan, uh, Stefano has said. Uh, I think the multidimensionality uh, of the inequalities that is manifesting uh, very, very clearly with the crisis is something that we need to kind of unpack and really look into. Uh, um, Stefano has raised a number of issues. I think one issue is, and, and certainly a challenge in your reflection, is how do we uh, combine the reflections on how do we address this crisis with how do we address the, the climate justice crisis? And looking at uh, what uh, um, a green new deal uh, but not the the typical green new deal that we've been hearing from europe or from uh, the mainstream media what that green new deal is but really what does a uh, 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 climate uh, just trans sorry jean the, the microphone has been turned off oh okay. sorry yeah okay uh, uh apologies for that i so basically what I was saying was, how do we combine our, our reflections on how do we address this crisis with how do we address uh, the need to achieve a climate just and fair transition for everyone? It is indeed about addressing the role of different uh, uh, countries, uh, the typical division of, of, of la uh, labor between commodity producing countries and how trade rules have been totally lopsided and unfair. Uh, how do we uh, revalidate the role of uh, local demand, local markets, local economies, but ensuring that multilateralism is respected. I think it is about reviewing uh, broader systems, uh, certainly about how uh, we engage with each other uh, as the global community. I think uh, it's certainly uh, reflecting on that, but at the global governance level, I think it's really raises a number of questions. Last week, we saw how US on the one hand and China on the other hand were pulling against each other and, and uh, uh, kind of preventing 
a, a more a fair deal, particularly the US preventing a more fair deal, particularly for uh, 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 developing countries who are in absolute need of extra resources and because of US fears about uh, uh, their, in, their interest and uh, uh, um, power in the international financial institutions being diluted by the new issuance of special drawing rights has been blocking that. I mean, these things have to be challenged, these things have to be uncovered, and these things have to be addressed. That's one thing. The tax justice system, I mentioned it, uh, um, um, Stefano mentioned it. Uh, we have the EU currently blocking uh, a tax reform agenda at the UN, questioning it, uh, constantly putting obstacles in it. Similarly, with the de debt agenda, uh, we have the uh, uh developed world and the um particularly the paris club uh putting uh, uh, uh obstacles at every step of the way of reforming multilateralism this cannot be the future we have to uh uncover this and we have to address this and i think the only uh way to do that is really joining as 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 uh development community and social movements and the community working on these issues together in going forward. Um, I think uh, Marta also had a question in the chat about communication and uh, uh, whether uh, because of the not only the lockdown that we are facing physically, but the media lockdown, uh, uh, the fact that uh, the media has only been covering uh, uh, domestic issues at the most uh, the, uh, covering developments in our neighboring countries, but really not at all. There's a total blackout, I accept and, and, and really uh, uh, acknowledge that there is a total media blackout around what's happening in the rest of the world. I think this is really uh, a challenging time for the development community to be able to communicate our messages. I think um, Social media is certainly a, a way that we have been using in the last few weeks and the month to uh, break that silence. Um, that does not stop and that does not stop the challenge to also break through to mainstream media. Uh, I think this is a challenge that indeed can only be broken if there is like I was saying uh, just before this, uh, a strong uh, uniting of the different movements and the different uh, platforms of uh, uh, civil society um, uh, to be able to break that silence. Okay, thank you. Uh, Marta is also mentioning two more questions from Manuela. She is also asking about, in your opinion, is it possible to do a global statement signed by civil society, scientific, political, economical, spiritual, religious stakeholders to fight together health and climate as the same emergency? And the second part of the question related to, um, is it clear with COVID-19 that we are living an unique complex crisis and that COVID-19 crisis is a clear example of a systemic crisis? And uh, we need a, a new systemic uh, change. Um, I think that uh, um, Stefano can also uh, come in on this. Uh, there is already a, 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 a front being formed, a united front being formed in, in, in global civil society, uh, facing uh, the UN, seeing that this is an important moment to really call indeed for the systemic and paradigm change, uh, um, a paradigm shift basically calling for a summit to address the, uh, the, the current crisis, calling for a, a, a crisis response uh, summit. It is a call that was made last week and the week before, and we are going to continue to push. And I think this is something uh, where we can kind of uh, bring together and amplify attention for all these issues. Um, if not, like I was saying in my uh, intervention, if we do not push now, this short, small window of opportunity that we have will close very soon. So this is the moment uh, we are strategizing and we would invite you, and I'm sure Stefano would be happy uh, uh, to give you more information of how to connect uh, uh, to this uh, growing uh, global platform demanding for a kind of uh, 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 
global uh, gathering. I mean, obviously not in the immediate term, but uh, uh, when it is possible and feasible and appropriate for all countries to come together to really reflect on what this means as a moment of systemic crisis for a paradigm shift. Okay, thank you, Jean. Stefano? Um, uh, thank you so much. I know we're running uh, uh, behind time, but thanks, Jean, for, for that. I think in many ways she has already expressed uh, it fairly well. Uh, the call is for uh, using the United Nations for uh, an economic reconstruction and system reform conference. We think that this is the moment in which the international community has to come together to really stop rhetorics uh, and start addressing some of these uh, profound, systemic, uh, uh, deeply rooted uh, structural challenges uh, that uh, clearly are fantastically exposed by the crisis. But let me say uh, something else on that. Um, I think we need to be also careful not to be trapped into the hyper spinning of social media. Um, I mean, I have been the the initiator and and certainly the signatory of many global appeals, uh, and so I'm I'm not speaking against that, but we also need to be careful, you know, um, the moment in which every day we sign thirty to forty different letters uh, by different subgroup of organizations, I think we have a problem. Because that's precisely what I was trying to say before. This is a moment to come together in collective unity. And this also means that speed is not a friend. Uh, speed is driven by our own vested institutional interests, because we want to put our logo on it, because we want to put it out to the media, you know? Not only, sorry, don't, don't get me wrong, uh, okay, I think you, you're understanding the spirit of my comments, it's not that I, that I want to speak against things that I also do myself, you know? But we need to recognize that this is a moment in which depth and uh, ex scope of participation, of collegiality, of collectivism, is much more important than speed and in that speed we need to be very careful of eurocentrism i see a lot of solutions being thrown to developing countries by european groups and very often we don't have the courage to step up to where the problem originates which is our own governments so i think we also need to kind of be aware uh, that we cannot be Eurocentric. We need to be truthful to the fact that we need Southern leadership. It is not only with tokenism, because we invite, uh, you know, the Southerner, you know, to be the token representative. We need to listen to what our colleagues in the South uh, are thinking, what is uh, their planning, and we need to try to slow down our processes, which are driven by our overcapacity, and being able to be on the same page with the South in the driving seat and recognizing that the nature and the beast is here. I'm not addressing the US because you see the US is, we take it as we take the moon, it exists, you know? There's very little we can do to change its orbit. But we can and we need to demand a different Europe. And that has to become much more the focus of our action rather than the reaching out to the countries of the South. Um, so I think it's important to, to, of course, engage into communication, but become much more concerned with collectivism, much more concerned with Southern leadership, and much more concerned with tackling collectively the political economy, economies that are within our own countries. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Stefano, thank you, Jean. Jean just has apologized because she had another meeting and she just had to, to leave a few seconds ago. And thank you also to Yara to, for sharing all your reflections and all your analysis that I'm sure that will help us in this way we are, we are having to, to reach our world in, and to see what, uh, what will be the proposal for this uh, reform 
and which will be uh, our position in this new context to, to move forward with our goals. So thank you very much. And thank you very much also for all the participants. Um, we will have now five minutes uh, uh, to, to disconnect a bit of, and to change to, to the other uh, round table. Uh, so uh, after this uh, small um, uh, rest, we will, I will pass the floor to Pepe that will moderate and facilitate the, the next stage. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me and best of luck for the continued discussion. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Estefano. Thank you very much. Thank you.